lecture for the new year and the new quarter in our invited lecture series, and I'm glad that we've got a nice turnout today. And we have uh, two distinguished guests here who have been here all week, uh, Dan and Julie Ryan, and we twisted their arms a little bit, and um, have, they have agreed to give uh, invited talks for us. And this afternoon, Dan is going to give a talk on statistical analysis and, analysis and information assurance. And you're not recording this, I hope. No. Um, and um, a little bit of background about Dan. You've all seen the flyers, but um, we've known Dan for quite some time. We've served on some boards and committees together. And um, he was recently at George Washington University, but now has joined the faculty at the National Defense University, where he is teaching information assurance, cryptography, and such in the systems management department. And I know that Dan has a lot to say. So, hi, <laughs> Dan. Um, without any further ado, let's get started. Thank you. Hello. This is sort of intimidating. Yes. <laughs> The bleacher effect, I guess they call it. Well, at any rate, I'm Dan. I like to do these talks very informally, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time if there's something you'd like to explore further or talk about or is not quite clear. Uh, I do have quite a lot of slides because I want to go through uh, some research that Julie and I have been doing for the last year and a half uh, that we think is pretty exciting. It's uh, an, a, an approach at using medical modeling to analyze information assurance problems. Basically, we're treating hackers as if they were diseases and firewalls as if they were drugs and using the sort of medical models that are used to analyze and evaluate drug protocols in the medical community to try to gain some understanding about the efficacy of the protocols and technologies that we're using in the IA community. So. Me, uh, start by showing you a heuristic. This is a heuristic we developed some years ago, and the idea here was that this was not intended to be used as a mathematical equation. It was a way of thinking about risk, so that we said that risk occurred when threats were able to um, exploit vulnerabilities to get to assets and, and do bad things to those assets and that uh, you could use this sort of understanding that's inherent in this semi-equation to understand what was going on. If the threat increases, then there's more risk. If you have more vulnerabilities, you have more risk. On the other hand, countermeasures, things that you do to stop the risk from being able to exploit vulnerabilities and get to your, uh, your assets, reduces the amount of risk that you face. So it's in the denominator rather than the numerator. And of course, it all depends upon the impact, uh, it, you know, how much you care about the asset and, and how much damage would be done to your organization and your ability to perform your mission if a, a, success were, a successful attack took place. But we never claimed that this was really anything more than just a way of thinking about things. We didn't say there were numbers that you could plug into these uh, these values to come up with some sort of numeric assessment of risk, just a way of thinking about things. And so we turn to the way that people were proposing that you actually be able to numerically or quantifiably address the issue of risk. And we found things like this, people talking about annualized loss expectancy, which they said was the product of single loss expectance and some, something called the annualized rate of occurrence. And you'll find these kinds of things in a variety of documents ranging from NIST documents to CISSP exam guides. And uh, they talk about exposure factors being the, the sort of, what we talked about as impact in the, the last slide, the, the impact that it would have on your organization if uh, a successful attack occurred. And the probability, of course, being the chance or likelihood that such an a attack would be successful. So the way it would work is something like this. An expected loss it is always a probability times an impact. The probability that the impact will occur times whatever the, the, uh, the value of the impact is. So, so converted into the terms we're talking about here, that means the annual expected loss is going to be the annual rate of occurrence of these events that we're talking about times the impact of each one of those events. And the 
impact turns out to be connected to the value of the asset, but not solely to the value of the asset. Because think for, for a moment, if, if the attack is on integrity, and you're able then to simply go down to your bank vault and recover your backup and come and remount the backup and get back up and operational, the amount of damage that you sustain from that attack can be quite small. It's just sort of the inconvenience of having to go down and get the backup and bring it back and, and mount it. So the, in that particular case, the impact of the attack would be much less than the value of the asset. On the other hand, if you consider a confidentiality attack on a weapon system design, say the weapon system cost you several million dollars to design, and the spies get in and are able to look at it, even though they haven't uh, uh, made it unavailable to you, it's still there, they haven't changed it in any way, its integrity is intact, uh, and, and you've still got it, you haven't lost it. But nevertheless, the spies have seen it. Well, what are they going to do with it? They're going to take it and they're going to use it in their, on their own behalf in the design of their weapon systems. And since they now know the operational parameters of your weapon systems because they have your design, that translates into a loss of additional personnel and equipment on the battlefield. So the exposure factor can be many times the value of the asset in such a scenario. So the exposure factor basically ranges from almost zero to some very, very large number. So now if we start thinking about this in terms of mathematical models, our information infrastructures consist basically of some set of information assets and some set of threats that are trying to exploit vulnerabilities to get to those information assets and do things to it. And we have values and we have exposure factors and we have probabilities associated with the abilities of those threats to actually produce that impact. And that's supposed to translate somehow into something called a single loss exposure. Um, and, and that's the, the value of the asset times the exposure factor times the probability that a successful attack will occur. Let's talk a little bit about those probabilities. Uh, the probability is zero if the asset is invulnerable. That is, there isn't going to be any successful attack if we've secured it so well that, uh, that it can't be reached by a threat. On the other hand, the probability is one if the stuff is out there in the open and sort of anybody can get to it any time they want to. And usually what we know is that neither one of those conditions, those boundary conditions, is true. Somewhere the probability of a successful attack is somewhere between zero and one. And since no amount of investment can make an insecure asset completely secure, if we make an investment I and thereby change the probabilities from piece of JK to piece of JK superscript I, some lower probability we hope, otherwise why make the investment, uh, we're still going to be in between zero and one. We're never going to get to completely secure. And some other fairly reasonable assumptions that people often make about these probabilities include the fact that they ought to slope downward. That is, the more investment you make, the, the better your security ought to be, and therefore the lower probability of, of a successful attack. And in the normal world, we would expect to have sort of uh, diminishing returns, which means that the curve is going to be concave downward. You can. Uh, you can certainly, I imagine, if you think about it very much, think of cases where neither one of those assumptions would be valid. So at any rate, we're told by the pundits that uh, the way to look at this is to take the expected benefit now of our investment in information security, some number of I dollars that we're being asked to spend, and figure out what that does for us. And what it's supposed to do for us is it's supposed to lower the probability of a successful attack so we've got the same impact that we had before, but we, we should be seeing a, a difference in the probability of successful attacks so we get some expected benefit. And then if we take away the actual amount that we had to spend to get that benefit, we get the expected net benefit of our investment. And the question is, you know, sort of what does all of that mean and how do we do that? And by the way, those equations that I just showed you assumed a single information asset was being threatened by a single threat. To look at it from the standpoint of the information infrastructure, we have to sum over all of the assets that are in that information infrastructure and all of the possible threats that might attack those information assets. But 
that all comports very well with the heuristic that we started with. You know, what it says is if there's no threat, then there's sort of no risk. And if there's more threat, there's going to be more risk, and, and so forth and so on. But there's some bad news inherent in all of this. The bad news is we don't have any way to get at those P's based on the currently available information. I know of no statistically valid information that's been collected that would give us an understanding of how likely we are to be successfully attacked. Any of you know of, of any such information? I mean, there's a lot of bogus information out there, like the much vaunted CSI FBI survey that you hear quoted over and over again. It says right in the survey that it's not a scientific survey and shouldn't be used in any sort of statistical approach tells us that something's going on, doesn't tell us anything about how much of it's going on. That's what we really need. Well, so we then yes. the concept that depending upon the possible threat when you look at things of like nature, et cetera, hurricane, there is statistical data to give you some, but not a lot of information on No, there's no statistical data at all. There's some data that tells us that something is going on. And even something about maybe some of the things that are happening. We know there are attacks. Citibank was attacked and Vladimir Levin took $10 million out of Citibank, never set foot in Citibank, never set foot in New York or the United States, did it all from St. Petersburg, Russia. So we know that successful attacks occur. What we don't have any information at all about is how often they occur and what the cumulative impact of those attacks might be. There are some sort of informal um, magazine surveys that you see. Completely statistic statistically invalid. Right. I mean, they're out there. You see all these numbers and stuff, and you hear people quote them. You but stuff like 10% of the, you know, Fortune 500 have yeah. this. And 80% of the problems an insider problem. Right. But if you look at the way those statistics are collected, they are not valid statistics. For example, in the CSI FBI survey, they send those things out to a select community. They're self-selected respondents, and you don't know whether they're reporting the same incident or different incidents. So if two respondents say, we got attacked, that could be two respondents in the same organization reporting one attack, or two respondents in two different organizations reporting two different attacks, and you have no way of knowing. So you simply cannot rely on any of the available information to make valid statistical statements about the probability of a successful attack occurring. We don't have anything that would help us do that. We can't do, as a result, quantitative risk management today. Impossible to do it. In spite of all those books that tell you to calculate the ALE and the SLE and the ARO and all those other things that we looked at. So the question that Julie and I have been addressing for the past year and a half or so is how do we get those probability distributions? How can we, uh, in fact, create those, those numbers? And the answer lies in something called the analysis of failure type data that has been used very successfully by the medical community to study diseases and drug protocols in treating those diseases. And you will find discussions of the mathematics inherent in this at these particular sources. I'll run you through some of it. The survivor function here is how many things are still operational as a function of time. We start out with our infrastructure and things begin to fail and over time we'll see in, in, you know more and more things fail because successful attacks will occur over time. We're not 100% protected and so there will be some exploitation of that residual risk successful attacks will occur and the number of systems that are surviving and still operational will go down. The failure time function is simply one minus the survivor function and that, by the way, is the probability function that we're looking for. And so we see that we can begin to use failure time data in order to produce estimates of the probability distributions that we'd like to have f of t being the, the failure time function, the probability of a successful attack, and small f of t being the density function associated with it. Calculations are fairly straightforward. If n of t is the number of systems that have failed prior to time t, and n of t plus delta is the number that failed prior to h t plus delta, delta being some very small number, of course, then you can calculate very easily the proportion of the sample that's expected to fail during that small interval from t to t plus delta. And that, of course, is 
equal to f of t plus delta minus f of t, and that allows us to then estimate or approach an understanding of what the, the uh, pro probability density function is. The failure rate function, which is typically in reliability theory called R of t, uh, is the probability of death sort of instantaneously for an individual that's alive at time t. You can translate it, that into the instantaneous probability of failure of a system that is operational at time t. And so taking the same sort of calculations that we do to get mortality tables, we can look at a large set of systems across our information infrastructure and we can use the calculations of the failure rate functions to give us information about the instantaneous rate of failure in that, uh, in that information infrastructure. In the medical literature, this is more often called a hazard function, uh, while it's called a failure rate function in the reliability literature. This is what we're looking at. S of t is a survivor function. That is, it's the number of systems still surviving at any given time t. And f of t, the function that we're looking for, the probability of failure, is 1 minus s of t. So this simply uh, are inverses of one another and cross at some point along the way. And this would be the instantaneous failure rate uh, function. And uh, this typical bathtub-shaped curve is very common, uh, commonly found in reliability theory and also in the medical literature. Now, we'd like to have all normal data and we like to have complete data so that all of this behaved as nicely as our textbooks show us when they give us problems in, in probability theory. But in fact, that's not true in failure time data. Data is typically skewed, typically right skewed. And also, not all of our systems that are operational will continue to be operational throughout the study. Some of them will fail for reasons completely unrelated to what we're studying. So in this particular case, we're studying security, so we're looking at successful attacks by malicious code or by hackers or what have you. Yes, sir? So are you saying that a system failure is just a successful hack? Because obviously there's different level of attacks based on whether it's like a denial service or just hackers putting in a trap door or something. That's an excellent question. <coughs> we have to very carefully define what we mean by a failure because an attack on the integrity, for example, might, might degrade the system somewhat without causing a complete catastrophic failure. And so we have to be somewhat careful in, in our definitional phase of our study to agree what we mean when we say a system has failed. But if we're careful about doing that, then what we mean is that it, it failed according to whatever definition uh, we used in defining our study. That's part of the whole design of experiments issue here. So if we have a system that fails because the hard drive crashes, has nothing to do with a successful attack by a malicious intruder, then we might say that that uh, data uh, had some bearing on the study up to the point of the failure, but the failure is not related to what we're looking for. We don't want to count it as the same kind of failure that we're counting when we count a successful attack. That sort of data is called censored data in the literature. The other way data can get censored is the systems can simply survive beyond the end of our study. If we've got 100 systems in the study and 60 of them are still up and operational when we get ready to stop and evaluate all of our statistical and the stuff that we collected during the study, then 40 of those systems are right censored in the study. And there's also left censoring and there's interval censoring and there's truncation. There's a variety of of complications, but the most typical thing that we run up against in the sorts of study that we have been doing are right censoring problems. And what right censoring does to us is it stops us from being able to use that easy mathematics that I just showed you that we would normally use in a, a creation of a mortality table or something like that. When, when the uh, censoring takes place, it means we have to go to a more complicated form of mathematics. We can have Type 1 censoring, we can have type 2 censoring. These are all part of the design of experiments issue as to exactly what we're willing to permit uh, within our uh, design. The first of the estimates that we came up with is called a kaplan meier estimator. And the kaplan meier estimator uh, takes advantage of the fact that we know about that censored data and actually allows us to use the fact that the systems survived up to the point that they did survive to, 
but doesn't penalize us for the fact that they succumbed for some reason not related to the particular uh, issues that we're concerned with. In this, in this case, security issues as opposed to reliability issue or some other kind of failure, failure of budgets or something like that. Uh, if there are no censored values, again, the mathematics become easy, but if, it's, if there are censored values, then uh, we have to turn to this Kaplan and Meyer approach. In doing this, we look at the failure times and we simply line them up in order. So we have failures at times T1, T2, and so forth up until TK. And we look at the number of individuals that fail at a given time, T, in our sequence, and we also look at the number of individuals that are censored in between any two of those times t. And so, and by convention, we say that we're going to start at zero and that after we go beyond the end of our count, we're going to assume that, the, that our functions go to infinity. So then we're able to calculate the probability uh, of a failure being the probability of the systems at risk immediately prior to time j minus the probability of those that actually fail at time j. And assuming that the uh, likelihood function is sort of a normal likelihood function, then the Kaplan-Meier estimator is this S super km of t, which is the product of the number of systems that we have, the number that fail at any given time, and the proportion. So the proportion is going down as we go along. And what we're getting is kind of an upper bound on the actual real function S that we're looking for. But it gives us a very nice estimate, especially if the number of systems that we're working with is large enough. If we have small numbers, well, then it's not as good an estimation as if we have larger numbers. And the instantaneous failure function can also be estimated in much the same way. If we have the <coughs> small f function, the density function, estimated, and we have an estimate like the Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survivor function, then we simply take the ratio of those and that gives us the instantaneous failure rate function as an estimate. A second estimator uh, was produced sometime later uh, in, it actually was produced several times. It's called, typically called the nelson allen estimator, but another uh, mathematician named uh, Altshuler also came up with it. So you'll find references to both or all three names in the literature. And this one works better than the Kaplan-Meier estimate if you have small sample sizes. And so you would want to, uh, to use this estimator. You'll notice that the numerator of this particular estimator no longer contains the n sub j you're still getting an upper bound estimate on the survivor function. If we know the survivor function, then we can easily calculate the failure function, and the failure function is what we're looking for to give us those <coughs> probabilities, the p sub jk's that we started out saying we didn't have. So this is a way that we can actually, by simply keeping track of the failures due to relevant security problems, of the systems in a select set that we're following in our information infrastructure, over a period of time, we're able to get these estimates, the Kaplan-Meier or nelson allen estimators for S, which gives us estimates for F, which gives us the ability to calculate the probabilities that we need to actually do quantitative risk assessment. The hazard functions also fall out of the same mathematics. Now, that's great. Right? Because if we now if we if we perform those kinds of experiments, we can actually get to those probability distributions that we were missing and that we'd really like to have so that we can make not just best guess kind of estimates of what we need to do in making investments in information and assurance. We can actually start to make quantitative quantitatively driven estimates and rational decisions about how to invest our scarce resources. But we can do better than that. The medical community has actually come up with a way of assessing multiple factors, not just single things, sort of a, an unsophisticated look that says, oh, this failed because of some security problem. We can actually set up a whole no a bunch of different factors. How often do we update our antiviral software? How much uh, uh, granularity do we have in our intrusion detection system? What kinds of firewalls do we have in place? All of those different design issues and even procedural issues 
that we've incorporated into our security plan for our information infrastructure can be put into an explanatory variable. And those factors can be used in what is called Cox models, which are non-parametric models, and we can get the uh, assessment mathematically of how much contribution each of those things makes to the overall security of our systems. I'll show you quickly how to do that. First of all, these are non-parametric studies. Uh, later on, I'll show you some, briefly some parametric stuff, but these are useful non-parametric studies like the ones we were looking at in the Kaplan-Meier and nelson Allen estimators only work well with single samples of data. So if we're going to go with multiple samples, we need to go to the more complex Cox models. If we want to, they can work fine for comparison of two or more groups of survival times, but they require a lot of information uh, about homogeneity of the systems. They're not useful where there's more than one type of attacker. So if we want to know what our infrastructure is going to do in response to hackers versus malicious code versus denial of service attacks, we need a more complicated model. And fortunately, we have one. If, if, again, we're, look, we're talking about survival time data, and the focus is on the number of systems that are surviving at any given time in the samples that we're following. And our objectives are to determine which of the elements of those explanatory variables actually contribute to security and how much they contribute to security. And we will, in the process, estimate the hazard functions. This all came, came up in a, uh, some papers by Cox in 1972. It's a semi-parametric model because we're not assuming anything about the distribution itself. We're just assuming that there is a distribution. And we're going to use the same hazard function that we were talking about before, the same instantaneous rate of failure uh, that we were talking about in the earlier analysis. And we're going to look at the notion that the post-investment hazard is proportional to the pre-investment hazard. That is to say that there's some proportionality constant that after we've made the investment reduces the hazard in a sort of direct way. And you can think of that, if you will, as moving the survivor function to the right. So if we start with this survivor function without the investment and we make an investment in information security, we would expect to see the survivor function move out to the right. That is, things are going to last longer. That's kind of neat because look at this. The difference between the two integrals gives us a very nice metric for assessing our security. And metrics are one of the things that we don't have very many of today in information security. In any event, the idea is that the change here is proportional and that the hazard function will actually be proportional at any given point after the investment to what it was before the investment. The constant of proportionality is, of course, the ratio of the hazards of death for the system that's protected to the hazard of death of the system that's not protected. So if C is less than 1, then we're actually doing good. You know, our, our hazard of death is going down. If C is greater than 1, then our investment is not only not helping us, it's actually hurting us. And so what we do is we start out, we have K systems in our infrastructure, and we have hazard functions for each of those uh, systems, and we're going to follow this investment I and see what happens. Our hazards are proportional, and in a, if we simply left it at that, what we would have is a function that runs from zero to infinity, which is not nicely uh, symmetrical about zero. But we can make it nicely symmetrical by doing a very simple transformation to, to the law of the proportionality con, uh, constant, which gives us a, a, a beta or a, um, um, the, the beta, the, be, the values of beta are telling us the proportion, the rate at which we're being helped. So they're the relationship between the things that we're doing that are improving things for us and uh, the things that are not improving things for us. So if X is the indicator variable that tells us whether the system is protected by the investment I or not, so X is either zero or one, and we take a look at the, the various systems in the study and 
Um, we look at the, the hazard functions, and you notice that we've gone over to an exponential function with this beta xj in there. This is the proportional hazards model, and it, it works when one set of systems is, is protected by our investment and the other is not. We can generalize all of this by using vector mathematics instead of using just the straightforward single factor uh, things, which allows us then in our vector to look at simultaneous effects across a variety of different countermeasures, different technologies, different procedures, and so forth, each one of which has one beta sub j value that we can look at to determine whether it's helping us, hurting us, or, or we're indifferent to it. So the explanatory variables uh, we, uh, we put into uh, our equations. There are other choices than this exponential approach, but the exponential approach, as you know from your probability studies, is a very attractive distribution that has a lot of, of interesting properties like memoryless properties that help us a lot in our analysis. It's very widely used in medical studies, very thoroughly tested, and, uh, and considered to be very reliable. So what have I told you? Well, first of all, we can draw on these models from the medical community, both the non-parametric models like the Kaplan-Meier estimators and the nelson allen estimators, and we can easily derive from failure time data the probability distributions that we need to do quantitative risk management. That's great, that's great news. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very sophisticated in terms of allowing us to understand what's causing the advantage in security. It just tells us we're getting some advantage in security. So if we go over to this more complex vector-driven model in which our various constants of proportionality are controlled by this beta vector, then each element of the beta vector allows us to investigate a different effect or the effect the different effects of different technologies, different procedures, different uh, policies, all simultaneously working within the information infrastructure that we're, we're working on. Now, there's still bad news though. And the still bad news is that nobody's collected any of this data. So we have now have the mathematical models. The Cox model approach that we talked about here was published in November by Julie and I in the Journal of Risk Analysis. And uh, the paper on the kaplan Meier estimate is, has been submitted for publication. Uh, so we have these, met these models in place. Now what we need to do is we need to go in and start doing that design and experiment problem, looking at the use of these models to collect the failure type data that we need to drive these things. In order to do that, we need to do two things. We need to collect the times at which things fail within our information infrastructures and we need to know what the explanatory var variables are for each one of those systems so that we can feed that data into these models and we will start to get real statistically valid measures of how well more frequent updates of antiviral software improves our security, how well use of more powerful firewalls improves our security, how well uh, any particular countermeasure you care to name improves the security in our systems and networks. So with that, I'll be happy to address any questions you might have. Uh, yes, um, with, the, this, uh, with all these models and such, it seems that the only thing that you are modeling are the known vulnerabilities. What about, for example, with your spy example, if, you know, the spy is just only looking, you know, not changing anything Excellent question. First of all, if you don't know a failure has occurred, then you won't uh, incorporate the fact that that failure has occurred into your model, and you won't get any information about it. So if, he's, if your spy is so good that he's able to get into your system, steal your designs, and get out without your knowing he was there, then that, you know, the, the model won't help you with that at all. Uh, as far as how it helps you, uh, you're being helped in two dramatically different ways by these two different approaches. In the non-parametric approach, the kaplan Meier and nelson Allen estimators, uh, all you know is that a successful attack took place and that therefore your security was reduced. And 
you, that enables you to calculate the probability distributions that successful attacks will take place. But it doesn't give you much information about why they took place, how they took place, which things are helping you more, which things are helping you less. That all has to come out of the more complicated Cox models. Sir? Are, are, these, uh, are these models dependent on the fact that you're keeping the, uh, the threat constant? So for example, um, with your hazard approach, the proportional hazard approach, you said once the, the failures start happening, then it doesn't change the, the shape of the survivor curve. Is yeah. that because the... Uh, that, that's correct. You are, you're, you're sort of assuming that the threat exists in the environment. If going back to the medical approach, you're sort of assuming that the diseases are out there. Now, it's also true that even though the diseases are out there, not everybody gets them. And so what you're really trying to do is understand how you can improve the resistance. You're not assuming that there is no resistance. You're not assuming that there's infinite resistance. And you're not assuming that the threat is, is growing or diminishing. It just exists in terms of these models. I have a question. By the way, this is a very nice model. But uh, one thing I have a question, a follow-on question, but for example, the SARS epidemic, right? The people, if you look at the general population, if you look at large populations, and they survive, the free of time curve doesn't change, because those are a very small number of people die. But, to, to, uh, in, in terms of those small number of people, the free of time curve, I mean, really, really change. So, so my question here is, if you talk about information uh, assurance, if you look at, you collect this data, you say, you have this model to predict the failure uh, the rate. It may be worth for a lot, large number of systems, not average. So the average performance will probably fit very well with the model. But if I'm I am a, a in charge of a network or a system, I really care whether or not my system is done. So that kind of not necessarily statistically a statistically good system not necessarily means my system. My system maybe just happens to be one of those. Well, there is inherent in the medical model the idea that if we work with a smaller sample than the entire population and uh, analyze what happens in that sample that the, the results are extrapolatable to the larger population. You, there are other types of studies, epidemiological studies, that deal with the larger population sort of as a whole. But the, the, the fundamental notion in the studies that you read about in the New England Journal of Medicine is that you can study a thousand patients and then extrapolate the results from, from studying those thousand to the population as a whole. Yes, John? Well, it's also the issue of when you're using these, these models, what you're trying to do is figure out how to best allocate your resources for a normal environment. But any allocation of resources also includes an allocation of resources for detection of abnormality. For example, a military needs to be prepared to go to war even though that turns out to be not the normal state of operations for a military. Yeah. So, so yeah. And you have to keep in mind with And we have, this, we have the, the, the Citibank problem is a, is a case in point. You know, prior to the Citibank Levin attack happening, uh, I don't think people would have assumed that the likelihood of, of that attack being successful would be very large. Afterwards, of course, there was much more concern about it. So isolated events in, are inherently difficult statistically. Right. So, so I guess the, the, the difficulty here is when we talk about security, it seems to be statistical. You have a statistical security, which I think you may be a little weak in a sense. You can say, oh, statistically, I'm secure. That means out of 1,000 uh, systems, 999 systems, it, it's going to be OK based on uh, this security measure. However, if there's one system fail, that one system could be the most critical. Could be it, one it, I, I'm in charge. It, it could be. That's why if you look at this this thing right here, what you actually have to do is impose on top of this a value function. And that value function attaches a value to each of the information assets within the uh, total structure. And then using that, you're able to come up with a probable a probable loss, if you will, that's that's driven by the individual value of the assets. Yes. Uh, that's difficult to do. It, it goes back to the whole question of what is each 
individual assets exposure factor. Uh, and that, the, the analysis is quite complicated, but it is theoretically possible to impose that value function on the, the mathematics and, and come out with the sort of answer that you're looking for. I can see that if over a large system like DOD, yes. I think this makes a lot of sense. I mean, I want to, even statistically, you know, the, the probability of system failure really can be reduced. That's a very good thing. Just saying, you know, individual system, for individual system, this may not help us. You're correct. Sir. How are people proposing to gather the data you need for this? Is, are they going to set up like a honey network and see what kind of things like that? Or That's certainly one approach. Data? That's certainly one approach. One way to do this would be to set up a special test bed and, and, and have a sort of double blind experiment where you have some of the machines were controlled group machines and some of them were test machines and look at what happens in that sort of subspace, if you will. And that, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, though, is to go into your information infrastructure, whatever it happens to be, and pick a hundred machines that are going to be the test machines and another hundred machines that are going to be the control group and then just simply follow those within your larger infrastructure. So it doesn't have to be a specialized subnetwork or an isolated subnetwork, although it could be. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just wondering if you looked at any other communities for models of cybernetic. We've looked at, at, at quite a number of things. We have some of our students working on Markov process models and even hidden Markov process models. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've looked at a variety of different approaches to reliability theory and how those might, might uh, play into this world. And, but the results are not as exciting, frankly, as these. They, we, we find it this, this quite exciting in terms of its promise to give us some real data that you really could use in a quantitative sense that simply doesn't exist today. Yes, sir. Can we look at what the insurance companies are doing in terms of issuing IT insurance? I worked with the insurance companies for about a year uh, trying to, to understand how to uh, to do things. It's very interesting how they uh, underwrite their covers. Uh, they do it with a mysticism approach uh, that is much different from the statistical approach that, uh, that, that we as statisticians would think that they would be using. Because they do use um, actuarial statistics yes. for life insurance and, yes. and fire insurance. Where, where there is data, they try to use it. So they're not doing that yet in the IT world. The data doesn't exist, right. and so there's no way to do it. Uh, what, what I did was I tried to use the fire insurance model with them and say, you know, let's bring the, the systems or the infrastructure that you're going to write a cover for up to whatever the, the existing technology is, like equivalent to putting sprinklers in the ceiling and fire retardant stuff in the walls. And then you write a cover for the residual risk between the existing technology state of the art and some cap. And uh, you'll get rich because you know that, that you can control the amount of that that residual risk that you're you, that you're accepting. And I'll get rich because I'll fix the systems when they uh, when they need to be brought up to code, and, and I'll repair them after they break. And uh, we'll all do well. Uh, Nick couldn't make that work. Couldn't make that work. However attractive it sounded to me, when I went to their underwriters, their underwriters are, are people who. Uh, who, who take a very mystic approach to it. You know, they, they take all this stuff in, but they don't do a statistical analysis of it. They say, oh yeah, well I think the old Karnak kind of approach, now that, I've, now that I've looked at everything I can get my hands on, the number is 12. And uh, it's, they're, they're very interesting people. They remind me of the Crippies I grew up with in NSA. Would, would the data you're looking for here possibly be maybe an enterprise network big? say collected all flow data for like a month and also had both signature based and behavioral based intrusion detection data for correlation would that be you, you could do that but if you have that kind of statistics you don't need uh, a sample theory approach what i'm trying to get at is that you could get valid statistics that you could use in a large information infrastructure by examining only a much smaller number of systems, say 100 or 200 systems, in an information infrastructure that consisted of thousands or tens of thousands of systems. You don't have to look at all of them. Just
just like in the medical community, they don't look at every male in the United States in order to try to determine the, the right uh, drug protocols to use for some particular disease. As, as technology gives us these capabilities, I mean, it's, it's not unrealistic, say, in the UPS network to collect all floating data from every single switch. It's not, you know, it, well, it may not be technologically unrealistic, but often those are economically difficult problems but to address. It's not necessarily anymore, though, because you can get many terabytes of, of data storage. And it's, the, it's the cost of analyzing the many terabytes of data that's the problem. It's not the collecting it. <laughs> yeah, I think when you were talking about that, that you wouldn't look at all, you know, males in a, in a given situation. You, I mean, you still have to look at information systems by type, by operating system, by purpose, by, I mean, you, you can't select 100 out of them and that doesn't include, you know, the web server because you haven't included them in the 100. You still have to look at web servers, only accept web servers, only the UPS, the only UPS, but you still have to have that within the idea that you have to look at, just like medical community does, a given disease, you still have to look at a specific section of that population. I mean, all of the things that we learn in design of experiment classes play into this. Right. So how you choose a, a, the the, uh, the set to be studied, how many uh, examples need to be included in each set, all of those things that you learn when you take a design of experiment class are applicable to this type of, of study. The point is, nobody's doing this. <laughs> you know, we know how to do this. We know how to collect the data that we need that would give us good, valid statistics that we can extrapolate to our information infrastructures, but I know of no one that is actually doing this at this time other than us, sir. Uh, it seems to me that the, the level of risk is uh, dependent on time, because for many, at any given time, the threat density is gonna be different. Uh, how do these statistical models account for that? Closely related to your earlier question, if, if the threat level changes or the nature of the threat changes, then something fundamental has happened in your experimental environment that you need to take, uh, take into account in your analysis. And there are ways to, to inject such things into your analysis, but they're not very um, helpful. Uh, it's much better if you can limit your experiment to a time period in which the environment is not changing dramatically. Uh, otherwise, you, you get into non-homogeneous Poisson processes, and they, the, the mathematics becomes very much more difficult. Sir. Um, you're talking about statistics. Uh, if you are analyzing, like you were saying, terabytes of information, if you were to filter that to where you had a certain types of attacks, you categorize them, and you had data filters that allows you to do that, what would be considered statistically valid as far as, would you have to collect all the data and, uh, or basically categorize every piece of data, or is it statistically valid to categorize it based upon a certain threshold? I'm not completely sure I understand your question. There are two issues here. One has to do with sampling theory. That is, to what extent can we sample a space and calculate statistics on the sample and then extrapolate those statistics to the, to the entire environment. And the other has to do with how we actually do the calculations against the sample and what those calculations tell us that might be extrapolated. And there are issues associated with both of those. The first ones are, are, are easier to solve because we've got quite a number of years of experience and mathematical basis for determining sampling theory, answering sampling theory type questions. In the second one though, you get into things like, suppose somebody's using a crypto, asymmetric cryptography versus symmetric cryptography. And you look at the, the beta, uh, effects of uh, what difference it makes to things and you say well I think you know I think I'm getting a, a, a larger bang for my buck out of the asymmetric cryptography than I am out of the symmetric cryptography there's some issues associated with the linearity of that relationship that are very very difficult to, to understand and very difficult to include in the models and you have to be very careful it, things don't scale nicely I just learned at times. I would think in a, right now in the information insurance world, basically uh, you would have to do your own type of scale because you would have to just establish what would be a valid attack. If 
based upon what was previously established. However, there's always new attacks being made, and they might have a lower threshold than what you're currently at. So I'm wondering what would be a statistic, where would, what's the, what, what's the good medium point to where you decide that a low or a high threshold is better than just trying to collect all the data and trying to categorize that attack? Those are difficult questions. Um, and I don't have a good answer for you. I, I guess I guess what I would say to you is, to all of you, all right, number one, we have looked at some stuff that looks very promising. And we haven't actually done this yet. We haven't actually collected the data. That's our, the process that we're undergoing right now. And I hope to be able to come back in a year and, and show you some tangible results of the actual use of these models. But it's very exciting and it, it, it appears to be very promising. The second thing I would encourage you to do is look at other ways to do the same sort of thing that we've done. We went and, and read some medical papers and said, you know, if we just think of hackers as diseases and, and firewalls as, as uh, uh, medical protocols, we can use this stuff that they're doing over there over here and maybe we can get some good at it. There's probably a dozen other places that you know that I've never thought of that you could go and look at stuff and say, you know, I bet we could use that in information assurance. And if we, if we all start doing that and start coming up with these models and start running the tests and collecting the data, then hopefully before very long, we'll be a lot better off when, when it comes to the problem of making rational decisions about how to invest our scarce resources in information assurance. Thanks. Okay.